Hello. Good evening. Hi. Good day to everyone. It's great to be all back here once again. And uh, we have another special guest with us tonight. Patricia Munoz is right here with us. Hello, Patricia. How are you feeling? Great to have you here. I know this is your very first webinar. So welcome to our IVF webinars. And it's definitely ha we are definitely happy and excited to have you here. Um, how are you feeling tonight? Hope everything is okay. Fine. I feel uh, very well. I'm very happy to, to be here. So I hope that uh, people like this webinar are find interesting. So I, I'm, I'm sure happy. it's going to be interesting. This is definitely an interesting topic. Uh, as you can see tonight, we will talk about maternal spindle transfer. Yesterday, we were talking about pronuclear transfer, uh, which is very similar to this one. But of course, um, Patricia will tell you a little bit uh, on uh, this particular topic. So remember, um, Patricia will start with her presentation. Uh, she will then answer all of your questions. So as always, remember to put those in the chat section and then I'm um, sure Patricia will be happy to help you out with anything that's on your mind. And let me just mention that uh, Patricia Munoz, she is the embryologist at IVF Spain. Uh, so yesterday we had Elena from IVF Spain and tonight we have Patricia. So I'm really, really happy that uh, we are able to provide you those topics. And um, as always, uh, it's wonderful to see you all here. And well, just let me remind everyone that, as you know, my Abby says we are part of European Fertility Society and we are here almost every single day to support you, to educate you, to provide you with some top fertility experts, embryologists, coaches, psychologists, and I could go on like this. There are many, many people involved and um, as you can see, there are more events coming up. So we are exploring new topics as well. And of course, maternal spindle transfer is still a um, brand new technique. And of course, um, right now you will find out a bit more on this particular one. Okay, so thank you so much. And let's get going with our presentation. Okay, Patricia? Okay, perfect. <laughs> thank you so much. Let's go. Okay, so um, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you to Caroline for invitating me to, to do this uh, webinar. So as uh, she said, my name is Patricia Muñoz and I work as an embryologist since four years ago in the clinic IVF Spain in Alicante. And today we're going to talk about the maternal spindle transfer. So uh, what are we going to do? is first a little introduction about the mitochondria. Also, if you see yesterday the webinar, you have all maybe this information, but I'm going to try to give you only a few data related to what are mitochondria and what are their functions. And also um, something about the mitochondrial disease and how they transmit to the, to the offspring. And then I'm going to focus on this specific technique called maternal spindle transfer. So uh, to start, I would like to, to say that mitochondria are the most common organelles in the cells. And they have a, a specific, um, very specific particularities like the self-replicates. Uh, self and also they have their own genome. Uh, also another particular thing is that they are under dual control, uh, one from the mitochondria and other from the nuclear genome. And um, this is going to, to affect the function. So uh, the main function that the mitochondria has are uh, the one to produce the energy that the cells need uh, to, to do all process. So they produce like almost 95% of the energy that the cells need, uh, but also they have other important roles like uh, they participate in the programmed cell death, or the calcium homeostasis, or their lipid metabolism, but uh, maybe this um, producing this energy ATP for the cells are the the main uh, the main function of this mitochondria, and this is the reason why the the disease derived from these um, problems in the mitochondria uh, could produce a severity illness. Um, um, you can have like a if you have a lot of this mutation and, not, and a lot of this uh, mitochondrial affected, you could uh, develop severe healthy uh, problems. 
such as um, retardation or psychomotor problems or neuropathies or ataxia. So it is very important to 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 research and to know how to to avoid the the transmission of these diseases. And for this, it's, it's important to to highlight that the this mitochondrial disease could be caused by mutation in both uh, nuclear DNA, but also in the mitochondrial DNA. So also the prevalence in the population ranged from 5 to 15 per uh, 100,000 in, in childhood. Um, uh, here uh, in the in the slides, you, you can see the, the most known um, mitochondrial disease. And the thing is that uh, actually, uh, currently, uh, there's no, uh, there's only few effective treatments and there's no uh, non cures. So um, it's uh, very important to research about this, uh, this mitochondrial disease and how to try to, to not transmit to the um, to the offspring and um, for this reason we need to know how they uh, transmit because this is very uh, very particular today we are going to focus on the mitochondrial disease that are due to uh, defects to uh, mutations in the mitochondrial dna not in the nuclear dna okay and uh, the mitochondrial have a very particular way to transmit to the offspring because uh, the embryos and um, the babies have uh, only uh, the, the mitochondria that comes from the mother because uh, when in during the fertilization the part who give the mitochondria and the cytoplasm to the embryo is the the oocyte is the mother so uh, the mother is going to transmit this um, this affection this uh, the mitochondrial dna uh, mutated to the offspring and it's important to say that um, the way how they transmit is uh, particular because you can find like different uh, cell types containing different number of mitochondrial DNA so uh, maybe in the tissue that is going to form the brain you have high uh, percentage percentage of this affected um, mitochondrial DNA, but in other tissues you have low low number of these uh, mutated uh, mitochondria. And also could happen that uh, you have the, the same, the identical mitochondrial DNA in your cells or that you have a mixture of uh, different mitochondrial DNA. So this uh, the thing is that this can affect um, the way how this, Ill, this DC this illness uh, transmit to the um, the offspring and also how it's going to how it's going to affect the offspring because uh, how we can see in the um, in the diagram uh, in the primordial cell, uh, germ cells what are going to are the one who are going to to form the um, the oocytes we have a low number of of mitochondria like between ten and two hundred and then uh, these cells are going to give the oocytes. So you could happen that you have an heteroplasmy, so you have a correct uh, mitochondrial DNA, but also you have affected mitochondrial DNA, and then you can produce, uh, depending on the grade of heteroplasmy that you have, you can produce a uh, um, oocyte without mutations, or maybe a uh, oocyte with uh, low mutations, low, uh, but you also can can have a uh, oocyte with a higher um, percentage of these mutations and this is going to to affect the offspring and the offspring is going to have um, maybe more uh, healthy problems or uh, severity healthy problems and the um, threshold that we establish is like between 60 and 80 percent but this is going to to be different depends on the mitochondrial disease so um, it's specific for uh, for any for any mutation, but used to be like between 60 and 80 percent. If you are, you have a higher percentage of this mutated uh, mitochondrial DNA, uh, you uh, it's probably that you are going to have a severe symptoms and a very bad 
uh, clinical uh, diagnosis and maybe also could lead to could lead to the death of the of the children. So um, what I would like to all also to say is that in this case, uh, well, due to this reason, the PGT I don't know is the um, when you take some cells from the embryo and you analyze looking, it just to be used for uh, aneuploidies to look for aneuploidies, but you can also look for these mitochondrial mutations. But um, due to all this particular inheritance, uh, maybe it's possible that you find that you have a low percentage of these uh, mutated um, mitochondria, but then in other is, uh, tissue that you don't have to take the cells from that, uh, you have a high percentage. So maybe you could lead to to have a baby which uh, will be affected uh, in the future. So it's not uh, it's not the best way to to avoid this uh, this transmission. And also because maybe if you are affected, uh, you are not able to produce these embryos without this uh, low mutation load. So this is the reason why new alternatives have uh, come, come out. So these are the mitochondrial replacement techniques. Uh, yesterday, my colleague Elena Lloret was talking about the pronuclear transfer. Today, I'm going to talk about the maternized in the transfer. And the other two, polar body transfer and DV nuclear transfer, are also very interesting, but um, in, at this moment, they have not yet registered any live birth. Uh, they are not also a uh, common study like the, the other two. So um, we are going to, to focus only in, in this maternal spindle. So um, what it consists, so this, techno, this technique consists in that you have uh, two oocytes, one from the donor, which is uh, contain the healthy mitochondrial DNA and other from the um, from the mother, from the um, patient that have the affected mitochondrial DNA. So what you are going to do is to take out, to remove the spindle which contain the genetic material from the donor oocyte. So you are going to remove and you are going to leave only the cytoplasm. And then on the other hand, you are going to also take out the, the maternal spindle from the, from the patient and you are going to put inside this uh, donor oocyte and then you are going to micro inject with the spermatozoa so you are going to have a cell with the maternal spindle so genetic material from the mother uh, the spermatozoa from the father and then the cytoplasm from the from the donor which is not affected the main problem of, the, of this technique and also happen with pronuclear transfer is that when you are doing you are taking out this uh, spindle also, you mm, take some part of the cytoplasm, so you are going to transmit a part of this cytoplasm to, um, to the oocyte. So the, the, the oocyte that you have reconstructed uh, has a um, bit uh, load of this, a low load of this affected mitochondrial DNA. And the study suggests that these are like between one five percent. But then uh, they have seen that it depends on the tissue and also the moment of the development. So there's no any guarantee that in the future maybe it can um, be higher and can the um, the child who, the the children sorry could be uh, affected. So um, this is uh, something that we need to continue a study and we need to. To develop more and uh, try to have more more data uh, because it's necessary uh, to know this information but um, for this uh, also we we ask if uh, who are the person for who this uh, this technology will be useful and um, the main uh, the main people who this is going to is the people who has this mitochondrial disease but um, is when these mitochondrial diseases are due to a uh, mitochondrial DNA mutation. If these mitochondrial diseases are due to nuclear mutations, this is not uh, useful for them. And um, the other um, the other thing that uh, it comes also it will well, some things are also carrying out this technology for this reason are uh, for the um, repeated failed treatments of IVF 
due to poor quality eggs or uh, maybe um, some patients that have a lot of IVF treatment and the embryos um, stop arrest um, and this is due to some cytoplasm defects. So you can use this uh, technique to try to, to improve these, um, these results because the mitochondria are very important for the oocyte maturation, meiosis, fertilization, and also embryonic development. So if you have uh, the cytoplasm, the mitochondria from the donor who has a, a correct fertility, uh, and you put the genetic material from the mother that has a lot of um, fertility treatments failed, uh, maybe you can get this um, this baby with your um, genetic material, but um, of course, uh, continue with the most uh, important indication: the 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 avoid of this mitochondrial disease. And the third one is the diabetes, because some result, some uh, research have shown that uh, sometimes the diabetes in the mother is due to those mitochondria and they can transmit to the um, to the offspring so um the thing is that um how all these technologies are uh, nowadays at this moment um the most important thing is that we need further research that uh, we need to have uh, more information about the long-term safety of these uh, techniques and also the efficacy and also uh, related to this concern that some mutated mitochondrial DNA could be in the in the cell and in the offspring. So these are the, the most important. And then, of course, any uh, technique have their own uh, advantage or disadvantage um, that makes them different. But uh, I think uh, in all techniques, if we are going to use in the clinic, we need to have these three things clear, that long-term safety, efficacy, uh, not mutated or reduced mutated in the mitochondrial DNA that could affect the offspring that are the most important. Uh, actually, uh, at this moment, the, the, the country, the only country that have a specific regulation for these uh, techniques are UK where you can uh, perform a PNT and um, pronuclear transfer and maternal spindle transfer, but only for mitochondrial disease to prevent this mitochondrial, the transmission of this mitochondrial disease. And actually they are very uh, strict and then very strong and they uh, don't have yet any, uh, they have not reported any live birth. Uh, because they uh, check all um, cases that uh, look for this treatment and they have to accept or not the, um, the legislation. So on the other hand, I mean, in contrast, uh, in Mexico and Ukraine, uh, Ukraine, there's no like an explicit uh, regulation regarding to, to this technology. So in Mexico, they have reported the first baby after this uh, maternal spindle transfer in 2016 uh, by the Dr. Tsang and uh, in Ukraine uh, they have also uh, reported the first baby after a pronuclear transfer and uh, in this case in Ukraine they use to treat this infertility and to, to get the baby for patients that have poor quality of the eggs or are having like the all oocytes arrested or they not get the, the blastocyte with good quality. Um, but um, for example, um, the same happened in Greece where they are doing a clinical trial, a trial sorry, for, um, for use this technology for the fertility treatment. And they have a collaboration with a Spanish, um, a Spanish company because here uh, this is not allowed. Um, so these are uh, mainly the first baby and actually um, at this moment in, in Ukraine they have like more than seven and more because they use like a normal, more or less a normal process, normal technique in their clinic and in Greece they have like a five or more babies at this moment but um, what we need for the um, for the future and for the, the the clinics and for the 
application of this technology is that uh, this newborn, this live birth, uh, need to be reported, and we need to to have access to the information. And I think they have to recover all this information because um, it's very important that we know the if this technology are safety for the future offspring, or um, and this is the reason why I think that um, further research is needed in order to use this uh, this technology like a usual technique in, in the clinic. But um, this is uh, my opinion, and I would like to, to finish this, uh, this webinar um, with some um, key ideas or highlight some things that I have uh, said during this, uh, this topic, like the mitochondrial disease uh, can be caused by mutation in both nuclear and mitochondrial DNA, that all mitochondria in the embryo originates from the oocyte uh, cytoplasm, and that actually there's no uh, cures for these uh, disease. So um, it's very important to develop these mitochondrial oocyte replacement techniques um, to try to, to avoid the transmission of these, of these disease uh, in the more safety way. <laughs> and, um, but this is only, uh, we can form, we can form, we, we can form, uh, perform only when diseases are due to mitochondrial DNA mutation, not nuclear. So uh, further research is needed, as I said, and also we need to study very well the ethics and applications of these techniques. Um, and the reason if we are going to, to use this to prevent this mitochondrial disease, or we are going to use also to treat the in the fertility treatments that have uh, failed before. So um, with this, I'd like to, to say thank you for your attention. I finished my presentation and I would like, uh, I hope that you find it interesting and I would be glad to answer all the questions that you have. Brilliant, thank you so much indeed for and, uh, explaining, of course, how it works and for your brilliant presentation as always. Uh, it's always great to have such uh, nice presentations and of course uh, you have explained everything. I think from my perspective, everything was clear. Thanks so <laughs> much. <laughs> and of course, now your favorite part, uh, Q&A. And of course, there are some questions. Um, the first one uh, will show you, there is one, of course, from Angela. How many years have you been doing the uh, pronuclear transfer, spindle transfer, and the uh, maternal spindle transfers? How many patients have done this treatment at your clinic? Yeah, <laughs> maybe I, I talk like, <laughs> like I performed this technique, but actually in Spain is not uh, a law. So that I know they are doing in Greece, like I said uh, in this uh, clinical trial, the, with a collaboration with um, Embryo Tools, which is a, a Spanish company. And they, that I know they have like uh, five uh, live births at least, and they are going to have more because it's a clinical trial. And they use this technique for infertility treatments. And in Ukraine, if you can visit the, um, the web because there are several clinics that have this, this uh, permission to do these techniques. So that I know have been born like seven in that in the clinic that I that I see. But if there are more, and also I suppose that um, there are more than seven uh, children born with this uh, technology, but in Spain it's not uh, possible. And I think that we have a hard uh, way to to get this permission. Thank you, of course, for your question, Angela. And thank you for the clarification. So at least yeah. at one point, it's not possible in Spain, but of course, um, we just need to wait for some more, more data and yeah. we will see, of course. Thank you so yeah. much. Um, let's have a look. There is one more question from Angela. What is the criteria that a woman would need to qualify for these treatments like age, AMH, FS, FH, etc.? Any others? Yeah. So, um, uh, of course, I think that there are two, two main reasons. One is that you, um, that you have this uh, mitochondrial disease and you want to, to avoid and don't 
and transmit it to your offspring. And uh, so maybe you have a good quality of eggs or you have a um, high um, ovarian reserve. So um, the reason will be this, that you have uh, mitochondrial disease and we have to avoid that you transmit to your offspring. And the other reason uh, that maybe you are in this uh, person, Angela, is um, asking me is uh, when you have a poor quality of the eggs that sometimes is due to this mitochondria. The thing is that you, um, for example, this clinic in Ukraine tell that you need to be less than uh, 40 or 37 because I suppose that they, they want that they, they need that the genetic material from the nuclear will be good. And also, uh, I think that you need a not bad AMH because you you need a um, higher uh, quantity of eggs because this process at this moment is a bit damaged. Uh, of course, there are uh, papers that or research that report that the success is the same than with the um, not treated oocyte, but of course you are uh, producing like uh, all this um, process to the oocyte. So maybe you have more possibilities to have an abnormal fertilization and also you have more possibilities that maybe the the PGT will be uh, not good or so I think that you need a, a high number of oocytes but also what uh, what you can do I think um, for the future because actually it's not possible in Spain but for the future I think that um, some papers have said that you can uh, freeze the oocytes from the patient so you can accumulate the the oocytes and then um, do this process with the donor in fresh so uh maybe if you have also a low ovarian reserve you can do this process because you continue freezing your oocytes and you have a high uh, enough quantity to be successful <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much indeed for a thorough answer again, of course. And let's have a look. Uh, okay, there is a conversation here going on. I just want you to have a look. Okay, so just to clarify, Angela has added, so no baseline AMH, FH number, right? Yeah, this is from the... From the, the same patient, exactly uh, the same patient. Yeah, yeah it's... I cannot, um, I'm answering, like, uh, thinking about this and seeing the, the reports from other, but I don't perform these, these treatments, so I cannot tell you. This is the, the, the line, the limit, but this is something more related to the number of your own egg that you uh, could have um, in, in order to, to have possibilities to to have a, a good embryo for the for the transfer after all this process and after maybe discard some embryos uh, because they have a higher uh, load mutation. So this is uh, the thing that I think will affect the AMH. But <laughs> thank you for the clarification again. Excellent. Thanks so much. Um, let's have a look. More questions are coming in. And here's the next one from Mariam. Do you have information which clinic in Ukraine is doing uh, maternal spindle transfer in Mexico? Do they do this also for infertility per egg? Yeah, what I know uh, but, uh, that, I have, um, that I have read is that in Ukraine they are uh, doing this pronuclear transfer, not the maternal spindle transfer, but actually is very similar. Um, the clinic that I say uh, that I saw it's one called Nadia, I think that also this uh, collaboration with Dr. Han, or Dr. Sam, that was the, the one that uh, do this um, in do this treatment in Mexico. So uh, in Mexico, uh, this child, the first baby after maternal skin transfer, was born but with this collaboration with this uh, doctor from United States, from some hospital. So um, I think that in Mexico they are not doing like a normal process, but in Ukraine how 
at least how the clinics looks like they are using like a, a process in normal process in the in the IVF laboratory and I think there are more than this uh, clinic but actually you need like a lot of experience a lot of training uh, to perform uh, this technique because I have never done but I was uh, reading a lot and it looks like complicated to to do this technique well you need a lot of training so actually um, actually not all clinics maybe could, could do this at least for the moment we will see in the future but we need uh, a lot of study and, and research at this moment So much indeed, of course. And yes, someone actually added that Nadia is performing this procedure. And also, if you've seen any previous webinars, there is uh, one clinic in Ukraine also that is doing yes. it. I've met, yes. uh, we had some webinars with Dr. Uliana Dovrofoyeva. And of course, if you are interested in this topic, you can yes. look at some other webinars at my IVF answers to find out a bit more. Uh, it's possible, of course, as well. And yeah, someone, yes, exactly, Angela. Thank you for so much. It's true. Yeah, uh, yeah. I remember the name. Sorry, I yes, remember. okay, of course. Anyone, if would like, I've met, it's right there. We had a webinar also with Birol Aydin as well, and this is possible there. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, and okay, let's have a look. Of course, more questions are coming in. Um. Okay, so I guess what total number do you have currently, I guess, in all the countries? Are you able to tell us? Ah, uh, number of uh, children born after... I think so. Yeah, Derek, let, let us know, but I think... Well, so. I think like collecting is like uh, 10, I suppose. I suppose it will be more because... I think these clinics from from Ukraine are using so I suppose this is going to to increase the number of this uh, population. What I hope also is that uh, with this increasing of this uh, population, we can have data related to the uh, how this uh, baby continue growing. And um, I hope that uh, this this will be useful for. For, for the other to, to improve also the, um, the technique, uh, to, to improve all these uh, methods. So I suppose they, they are using, so not outcomes yet, patients. Ah, just uh, patients. I, I don't know, I'm not sure about uh, what is uh, he has. Follow up, so not really the outcome, but how many patients yeah. How many patients? What I have uh, read, but of course I don't know the data from the clinic, is that uh, at least in Greece five um, five uh, children, and um, in Mexico was born uh, also a children, and then in Ukraine I have read like more than seven, but I don't know the exact number because uh, I suppose are data from the different clinics, so. <laughs> Totally okay, of course, Patricia, so don't worry. Thank you so much indeed um, for your follow-up as well, Derek, and I hope that was helpful for you. And yeah, there is a thank you, of course, as you can see. And let's have a look, okay? There is one more question here. Mariam has asked, can maternal spindle transfer be done on a mosaic embryo to try to make it normal? Can maternal spindle... But... Um be done on a mosaic embryo actually is that this uh, maternal spindle transfer you do at the at the beginning when you have a uh, we, perf we uh, people perform in the mature oocyte so uh the embryo is something that came after this fertilization so the transfer of the maternal spindle and um, you have to do uh the first step when you have the mature oocyte and you have to remove uh, the one from the donor and put the one from the from the mother. So, like you, that I know you cannot do in a mosaic embryo to try to to make it normal because in an embryo you have a lot of cells. Uh, for example, in a, a blastus you have hundreds of cells. So 
if you um, fix one cell, is it's not uh, important related to the other uh, hundred of cells. So this is a technique that you have to perform at the first uh, in the oocyte uh, maturation. Maybe it could happen that um, when you have a, a poor quality of the of oocytes, sometimes, and this is due to the mitochondria, the mitochondria are very important for all this process of meiosis, mitosis, maturation. So maybe uh, if you have some problems with uh, the mitochondria, you could have more uh, possibilities to have more psych or abnormal embryos. So maybe in this case, if you do this maternal spindle transfer, but at the first uh, moment uh, to, to try to, to, to improve the, the fertility results, the quality of the, of the egg, you can uh, have maybe less unemployed embryos. Maybe this could be, but um, when you have the, the, the embryo form, you can not fix with this uh, technology that I know for the moment. Of course, thank you so much for explaining how it works. Um, and of course, let's have a look. More questions are coming in. And let me just go ahead with the next one, next follow-up, okay? Can you please repeat the name of the doctor you mentioned? Does this in Mexico? Yeah, uh, Dr. Sam. It was also in the presentation that it mm -hmm. came on New Hope uh, Fertility Clinic. And I think the, uh, the, um, the child was born in, in Mexico, but there was a collaboration, so. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you have this in your presentation. Do you remember maybe which slide so we can just show it once again? Ah, and here, yes, is this okay. one. Okay, thank you, just, just to make sure. So you can, uh, sorry, what was the name? Yeah, the name is, is not, Ah, here in 2017, Dr. John Sang, USA, and Dr. Valery okay. Sutin, Ukraine. So, is the one that perfect John Sang 2016 was born. Excellent, thank you. I believe that you can see it right here. So, um, thanks a lot for that. And let's have a look, more questions are coming in. Uh, sorry, I came in late. How are you identifying the spindle? Uh, okay, <laughs> uh, okay, not not mine, not me, but uh, the people uh, what the um, due to the this spindle have like this microtube, microtubules. So uh, they have this property uh, of refrigerants. So uh, with the polarized microscope, you can. Um, you can detect these uh, refringents from the microtubes, so you can identify the, the maternal spindle. Actually, um, also I have a picture in the slide, if you want that, that we put, <laughs> because I think it's so clear. Carola, you want? It's a lot again, of course. Um, and yeah, actually, I have a picture in the in the slides oh uh, yeah so sorry yeah and which slide was this yeah this one it's like a this is this is with the um polarized microscope so you are detecting here in the pipette and also here inside the the spindle so it's easier if you have the the technology i suppose <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much, of course, uh, for explaining. And Derek has asked one more question, okay? Um, let me just show you this. Are you using a pole scope or another method? The video to the show, sorry for the tech question. Yeah, it's, um, I don't perform this technology. I was also only explaining how, because how it was late. I was explaining also how it works in some... Uh, ideas, but uh, what they use is the polarized microscope, I suppose is the polyscope. So um, this is the method that I have seen that they, they use to, to localize this material spindle because it's very important to know where it is exactly, because in this way you can do damage less the, the oocyte and also the genetic material and the organization. And uh, you, you um, need to try to get the low quantity of the cytoplasm 
So you need to be sure where it is and check out with every caution. So. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Zarek, for those technical questions too, right? <laughs> Thank you so much indeed. We don't mind at all. <laughs> um, okay, and as you can see, there is a thank you from Derek as well. Um, next question from Kat this time. What are the ris risks of using nuclear on spindle transfers? Anything to be worried about? Yeah, so, um, oh, for example, the spindle transfer has the peculiarity that um, in the pronuclear, you have the, the nucleus, uh, the pronucleus, um, uh, with the membrane, so the membrane is like protecting the nucleus, the pronucleus, sorry. So when you are transferring this pronucleus, uh, you have lower possibilities to, to lose some, uh, uh, like some part of the genetic material, but actually in the spindle, the, this doesn't happen. You are using all this technology, but uh, during the process, uh, how they are not recovered by any membrane or something, to protect. In some research have uh, shown that you sometimes have more uh, abnormal embryos or maybe an abnormal fertilization because you lose part of this um, maybe part of this material genetic uh, genetic material part of this chromosome so one this could be one of the problems and also um, People is uh, concerned about what we have said before that when you are doing this technique, you are going to transfer affected uh, mitochondrial DNA if you perform this technique to avoid uh, mitochondrial disease. You can transmit um, low quantity of these mitochondrial um, disease to the to the embryo. So at this moment, the research saw that you have a low quantity of this mitochondria, but um, the mitochondria have a very particular way to, to transmit. So some uh, research have shown that uh, the offspring of this, um, that they obtain with these uh, techniques sometimes have a higher percentage of this mitochondrial mutated. So maybe you um, could go to, to transfer an embryo that looks like uh, healthy, but then in the future, this child could have this, this, this illness. So this is the reason why I think it's um, needed to, to, to research more uh, about this, because um, we need to, to be sure that the, the offspring is going to be, to be safe. Also, there are some concerns about if there's some uh, problem when the um, DNA from the nucleus is from one person and the DNA from the uh, mitochondria are from other person of, or if the two kinds of mitochondria are in the same oocyte. So also research are concerned about this. So more information are, are needed. Brilliant. Thank you so much indeed for explaining yet another question. And of course, for your question, definitely interesting as well. And um, we will be slowly finishing, but of course, uh, there is one question here. And let me just remind everyone that if you have any more, you know what to do. Just type those in in the chat section. And the question is, would you recommend genetic testing in embryos after performing maternal spindle transfer? Yes, um, of course, I want to say that um, we don't perform that uh, technique and I'm not, uh, of course, an expert in this technique, but what I have been uh, reading, um, I would recommend because uh, due to this reason, because how I have just said, uh, during all this process, in the just in the maternal spindle, uh, you can, there's the possibility to lose part of this, um, of this genetic material. So then maybe you have more possibilities to have an abnormal embryo and transfer an abnormal embryo. So um, also more research is needed. <laughs> this is the most important thing. And uh, also uh, long-term um, uh, long term data about the the life birth the the people the children born uh, after this method but i will recommend you to to this to this problem to this concern that i have talked 
that the um, spindle is not recovery and maybe you can lose some information, some chromosomic uh, material and then could, could lead to an abnormal uh, embryo. I sorry, and also <laughs> sorry, and also to to check that the the um, the career from the um, uh, mitochondrial mutations are low or you have higher. This in the case that you are using due to uh, mitochondrial disease. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much once again. Uh, great question. Thank you for your answer to this. <laughs> And well, um, next one, it's not really a question, but I think that uh, you can see it. You can have a look at it. I'm guessing, I'm guessing that these procedures are the later more refi refined and further research treatment to the very mitochondrial transfers done. I spoke to the first woman that did the mitochondrial transfer in the US recently. Her daughter is now 19 and she said her daughter is healthy. Very bright. Thank you. I I'm very happy for this. <laughs> yeah, because it's I the think that uh, it's um, I suppose it's very frustrating that you have this mitochondrial disease and you know that you can transmit to your offspring and maybe uh, of course there are other options like uh, adoption or egg donation, but um, I will be very happy and I hope that in the future we could offer this technology to to people without any without having any problem and being sure that we are uh, doing uh, much as well as we can. And also um, maybe when we start with the microinjection, uh, some people think about what is going to happen with the baby. And um, after years, uh, we, we see that the, the, there's no any problem and that we can use this technology. So I hope that this happened the same with these new techniques. Thank you so much. And of course, you can see the comment here from Angela. This woman did this to, due to age-related oocytes, not uh -huh. any disease. But yeah. still, what you said makes perfect sense. And of course, um, as you said before, right, this is a new technique. Uh, we still need to wait for some more research. We need to wait for more countries to be able to do it, yeah, because we still see that uh, there are only a few countries that actually are performing this um and well okay there is a question to angela i guess so um yeah where did she do this yeah angela if you can share it in the chat section that'd be great i mean everyone uh, i'm sure will be happy to know that i don't know the answer <laughs> but um it's definitely an interesting topic and this is something that probably in the future will be um, quite uh, quite uh, method to, to use, yeah, for sure. Okay, sorry, um, let's have a look. Okay, if you can have a look at this question, does mitochondria have genetic features like appearance, IQ? I don't know exactly what um, she's uh, referring to. Okay. Uh, can you cl clarify so we can um, like if they have mutation maybe they look like in other way or or I think that the best way to to know if uh, if uh, mitochondria have some genetic problem or some uh, mutation is to perform a uh, genetic testing but I don't know if she's referring to to this. Or maybe this uh, question for a um, cellular biologist. <laughs> I don't know, but I don't know what this referring to. But um, I think. okay, excellent. So thank you so much. Of course, that that there is a bit of a conversation. That's why I'm looking at this. Okay. Um, Okay, yeah, because of course of the question in regards to um, uh, where was it done in the US, okay? So that's why I'm looking at this. Um, so we just, okay. Okay, no props. Okay, I did a lot of research on this and I wanted to do it. Okay, Angela, thank you so much for sharing all the information that you've got. It's definitely an interesting one uh, because it's, it's still something new, so 
you know, lots of research, different countries. So thank you so much for sharing. And I guess we will be finishing. Although remember that if you have questions, um, you can always get in touch with Patricia and her team at IVF Sp Spain. And I'm sure they will be able and happy to help you out. And we will be finishing for tonight, but uh, I already want to say to Trisha, thank you so much for um, being here with us, for answering all the questions, not the easiest ones as well. So thanks a lot. You've done, you've done a great job. And before we finish, is there anything else you would like to add? Yeah, I would like to say uh, thank you. Thank you, Caroline, and thank you for all uh, all people for their attention and I hope that they find interesting and um, <laughs> anyway if they have some questions maybe I cannot answer or but I'm going to try so uh, also I ask them to share with me this information because uh, I think this is the most powerful uh, tool that we have so we need to, to continue researching and I hope in the future we can help all these uh, persons that want to to do this uh, use this technique due maybe to fertility problems or maybe to mitochondrial disease. So I hope this is going to continue the research and sharing. So I will be happy if they contact me to to ask or to share. <laughs> so sure. I'm very happy to be here and thank you for for the invitation. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. And before we finish, there's one more question I missed, sorry. <laughs> and as you can see, great presentation. Thank you for all the information. Is it is it coming soon in other countries in Europe? Are you familiar with any news? Yeah, I am actually, there's a, um, a, paper, a paper related to different countries and how these uh, technologies, these techniques are, are there. And um, here in Spain is uh, not uh, allowed, as you said, but for example, the company who is working to, to uh, working with Greece to do this uh, treatment, this, um, this maternal spindle transfer in Greece, uh, they hope, they have said that they hope that with this data, they can maybe make a pressure in the Spanish government to to maybe be more relaxed with these techniques. But I think that uh, Europe is uh, difficult. Uh, we need to have a more uh, research. Um, maybe Canada or other countries will be um, earlier than in Europe. <laughs> that actually in Europe, there are some um, um, countries where egg donation is not allowed, PGT is not allowed. So this, I think that uh, these um, countries, if don't allow PGT or, or donation, are not going to allow this technique. That mm, that makes sense. That's true. So. Um... Again, this, those techniques are still something that we need to wait for and hopefully in the future it will be possible in yeah. most countries at least. Um, so, okay, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, okay, Derek, thank you so much for sharing. As you can see, um, you are not, Patricia, you are not the only one. I'm an embryologist, no. The procedure thank yeah. you so much it's great to see um some some you know um other the biologists here that's amazing i mean it's always great to have some other um experts as well in the field of course uh, joining us and we will have more interesting questions <laughs> as well so thanks so much um as always, remember that it has been recorded. So if anyone would like to have a look at this once again, or maybe would like to share it with anyone, it's possible. All you need to do is just go to my IV Fences. It will be available tomorrow on our site, but also on our YouTube channel. So I can only encourage you to um, follow us there. And well, thank you so much for joining us and for your incredible questions. As always, it's been a very interesting session and it's always great to see you all here uh, asking questions, that's for sure. Patricia, thank you so much. It's, so it's much. been a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant session and mm -hmm. I just hope that we will have some more options to, to cooperate. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. 
And take care, everyone. Have a lovely evening or day, wherever you are. And of course, as you know, we will be back on Thursday, actually, not tomorrow, but on Thursday. Uh, Elena uh, Yoret will be right here with us and she will talk about NK cells, which is another interesting topic. So I just hope you will be able to join us on Thursday. And well, see you there. See you there. Thank you so much, Patricia, once again. Take Thank care. You. Bye. Bye. Thank you.